The sun is so loud. It's so loud. <laughs> good day, everybody. How's everybody doing? Great. Great. All right, good. My name is Ray Andrade. I am LMU's programming librarian. And on behalf of the entire library staff, I welcome everybody to our final installment of Faculty Pub Night for the 2017-2018 season. So for tonight, we're going to welcome Dean Scheibel, Professor of Communication Studies and Director of Interdisciplinary and Applied Programs. However, before we formally begin the program, just a couple of points about Faculty Pub Night. Faculty Pub Night is not for faculty only. Students and staff are more than welcome. Another thing, pub is a play on words. Pub as in publication. Faculty <laughs> Publication Night. Um, so if you're 21 and over, you do qualify for an alcoholic beverage at the bar. Um, if you're not under 21, I apologize. So feedback forms. On your seats, you should have seen something that looks like this. If you fill this out and if you include your email address, you would be entered into a raffle for a $100 Amazon gift card. And students, in, just in case you didn't sign into Leo, please see John, the guy with the bow tie. He's in the back with a tablet where he'll sign you in. All right, and with that, we're going to quickly get the show started. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dean Scheibel. Dean. Thank you. Thank you all for showing up. Few but mighty. <laughs> and, 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 and loud. So, before I actually get into uh, the research, a uh, little history in terms of my background with comics. Hmm. I was not interested in comics when I was a kid. I wasn't like remotely um, Big Bang Theory. No. Uh, <laughs> I started drawing comics. At, in high school. And actually, I didn't even draw. I found a, a photograph, a, a drawing of a penguin. I a photocopied it about 10,000 times. And I started making um, comics. Uh, it was a comic called Thursday Dirt. And it was basically just a cultural critique of graduate school, particularly the faculty and um, the graduate <laughs> students. Uh, I think it was actually masking my own discomfort with like words and concepts like phenomenology and <laughs> epistemology, which to tell you the truth, I'm still not sure about. Uh, um, and I, I came here and I continued to do some comics related to the department and on committees. I was actually on Margaret Casamatis' uh, assessment committee and I did a comic about um, Wasp coming here, and oddly enough, she wasn't all that amused. And I, I got off the assessment committee shortly thereafter. Uh, but at, at one point, um, before communication studies was its own department, we were part of the School of Film and Television, um, a professor, um, Pat Connolly, gave me a book uh, about a priest, Father George Dunn, and I read this, and I'm going, this is fascinating, I really like this, because uh, it talked about his involvement in the Hollywood studio strikes, which is something that my parents um, had been involved in. So I ended up writing a script uh, for a graphic novel, and then I started working with a professional illustrator, and that was 10 years ago, and we're almost done with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a whole list of other ones that will not take that long. <laughs> uh, but as a result of that, uh, another professor here, uh, Holly Levitsky, asked me to teach a course, uh, Jewish graphic, graphic novels. Actually co-taught it with somebody who knew something about Judaism. <laughs> and I could recognize bagels, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I was astounded at the quality of comics that students um, could create. So in that class we had them read graphic novels, but we also had them create graphic novels about the process of doing that. And I was so uh, I impressed with this that a few years later um, I decided that I wanted to integrate um, comics into my own classes. And I started with a class, Introduction to Communication Inquiry, uh, Com Studies 204, later Com it became Com Studies 1700, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, but basically this project that I'm presenting tonight is about the comics that were created in that class. So uh, after going through IRB, 
Institutional Research Board. Uh, uh, I collected comics from that class for several years, about 125 comics. And from those, I selected about 20% um, that were sort of interesting, and I did an analysis. I, I did not know um, what I was going to be uh, looking at. Um, I just knew that uh, comics seemed a good way to have students reflect on the process of doing lit reviews. The, the idea is we don't learn just by doing, but by reflecting on our experience. So, so he, what I came up with the, after uh, analyzing this, I came up with something, the myth of the student hero and the dreaded lit review. That's what I'm calling it. <laughs> and and uh, I had to learn about myth, and I'm still in the process of doing it. It's a very thorny subject, and lots of people have written about it in different ways. I'm going to start off just with saying a myth is a narrative within a community that has shared interests supports a particular order of things, but is linked to more all-encompassing um, themes and images. And we're here in the library, and I need to say something about that. Beyond the library being so wonderful to allow me to present this here, and beyond um, this research being um, published as a digital book, and Melanie Hubbard um, will be talking about that uh, at, at the end of things. Uh, but the important thing is that the library is a central character and feature within the myth. So it's, I, I'm not just presenting it here. It's like the library is integral to the very myth. Hey. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so rather than rather than go um, like crazy about uh, discussing you know the theory in great depth, I'm going to unpack the theory using the title pages from some students' comics. Um, though briefly, I, I will tell you I, I use several um, theories, not just get them out of the way. I use uh, Joseph Campbell's. Uh, I'm a hero with a, uh, with a thousand faces, popularized myth. Uh, I use um, Carl Jung, uh, in this is only a recent discovery in terms of the shadow and, and the trickster, which um, Campbell mentions them very briefly in passing, but not much. And then I use um, Kenneth Burke, who has written a lot about myth. and. Uh, actually, a, a recent book has come out, Kenneth Burke on Myth, um, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, which, which, which was sort of useful. Um, <laughs> so, all right, so, so, here, so here we go. Okay, so we start here. Here's the first one, the dreaded lit review. Um, now, a few things uh, about this. Okay, so one of the things, one of the things I have to t tell you is in terms uh, of Joseph Campbell, his monomyth is, is basically goes out like this. Uh, the hero le um, leaves the everyday world, um, gets submerged into this new world, goes through a bunch of, tr uh, of challenges, and then returns uh, to the world with some boon that is ben greatly benefits uh, the, the hero's um, society or culture or tribe. And one of the things I'm going to do here, you're, you're going to notice that I use the word she as opposed to he. Now, Campbell exclusively deals with male heroes. Uh, and I'm almost exclusively dealing with female heroes. So when the hero finishes the journey, The return is a return from the uh, kingdom of dread. <laughs> That's literally what Campbell calls it. Okay, and here we have the dreaded lit review. And the word dread comes up a number of times. Um, so he, here's what we see: a few things about this. Dean, 
Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the word uh, dread is related to the word awe, which can be interpreted a couple of different ways. Awesome, good, awful, bad. And you can see Nicole Frankel here is looking more awe, bad. Yeah. Now, now the other thing that we see here is uh, um, the title seems to be dripping blood. And at least that's how I'm choosing to interpret it. <laughs> and, and the idea that it's dripping blood suggests that uh, the student hero and the lit review have some sort of common substance. They're both alive. They both bleed. And um, yeah, OK. So. So, so this is one thing. And the dreaded literature, it's short for literature review. However, um, it's not just an abbreviation. How to make your review lit. Your literature review, that is. So the idea here is literature, it, it, you know, and as we say in the academic trade, the literature, this is academic discourse in, in all of its glory. Um, and lit is student jargon. And lit is very much, when people talk about things being lit, they're talking about people being drunk, they're talking about being stunned, they're talking about sex, is it being lit up. And so this is, in some ways, lit is where, where literature is a place of shame for students because they don't understand it. And we'll get more to that later. Lit is the antidote to it. Okay? Um, so the, and, and part of the things with Kenneth Burke here, he, we are interested in, for, for Burke, he looks at both myth and ideology, that, that, that myth leads toward images and ideology leads uh, more toward ideas. And the fact is that's what we're going to see the whole thing. We have uh, the ideology of the academy, which is academic writing uh, personified in the standard academic paper, the literature review. And then we have the comic, which is the reflection on the process of doing the literature review. So we have, on one hand, we have the shadow being, re, being reinterpreted by the trickster. OK? OK. <laughs> what the lit? OK, I'm, I'm a little sorry for the profanity, but what the lit is, <laughs> it's what the fuck. <laughs> OK? It's called what the lit. And it's in post-lit review. We see the grinning skull here, and I, I'm not sure if the skull is the death of the literature review or the death of the student. It could go either way. But it does suggest a number of themes related um, to the trickster. And let's see. Uh, OK, so the trickster, the characteristics of the trickster include being trapped, boundary breaking, shape shifting. The obsession with their own name. So we, here we go, from literature to lit, right? Um, obsession with sex, the use of scatological references. And I got a lot of this from uh, uh, a scholar named uh, Helena Basil Morozow. And, and she sort of was my entree into um, Carl Jung. Um, OK, so. Oops, wait a second. Is that this one? No, I got that one. OK. OK, and, and so here we, here we have it. Karina the comic versus the lit review. And here we have it. It's like the student actually becomes the comic. And you can see the tears in her eyes. And this whole thing of versus is really significant, because we get at the, the idea of competing ideologies. And the idea is that we have 
the ideology, this counter ideology of the comic that reinterprets uh, the story of doing um, the literature review. Well, I think I had something else to say about that. Let's see. Um, all right, so so part of part of this is also um, when Burke talks about um, myth and ideology, he frames this in terms of old classical studies of myth, and particularly he looks at uh, the world uh, um, of Joseph Fontenrose, who wrote a book uh, on uh, a Greek um, uh, deity, Python, and who is battled by the, the um, sky warrior, who ultimately defeats Python. And that's what's going on here. We have these competing discourses. Being a communication scholar, I'm sort of interested in language and things like this. And this is what we have. We have the academic discourse of the Lit Review being defeated by the Lit Review. Now also the thing is, for, in order for the student to be a hero, for Burke, the hero has to, define, has to defeat a worthy enemy. <laughs> okay, so, so the fact is, it's like a lit review is a pretty horrible paper that students have to do. It's like, ask them. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it goes on for months and there are they're, they're assignments leading up to it and they have to learn all sorts of stuff and, and I'm going to go into that now. So, but the idea here is by the student conquering the lit review, they are battling a worthy enemy, at which it points, yes, I can retell this story, and I am heroic, and it is, my battle with the lit review was, in fact, mythic, okay? All right, um, let's see. Okay, let's see what we can come up here with next. Okay, so enough with theory, on with, um, the actual myth. Okay, so um, for Campbell, the, 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 the hero starts leaving the everyday world, and here's, a, here's our common uh, everyday student returning to college and, and optimistic, LMU, as gorgeous as ever. Maddie couldn't wait to start classes the next day. Little did she know what waited for her. <laughs> so this is, this is what Campbell calls the call to adventure. Now, some people resist this, and this is called the refusal of the call. This would be the refusal of the call. I have nothing to write. I'm going to fail this class. Head down on the desk. Fuck. Do I really need to go to college? Okay. So th this is a student who really does not want to rise to the challenge of doing the literature review. Now, sooner or later, it, it's sort of like the Borg says when uh, they address the star, star ship Enterprise. Resistance is futile. They, they have to choose a topic. And, and this itself um, is, is tough. So here we have, in, in Shana Duong's comic, a beautifully hand-drawn one, uh, we see she gets old trying to find a topic. <laughs> the sea of trouble is the sea of topics. And, and um, the ocean is a significant uh, place for myth. This is a place uh, of, uh, of immersion and emergence and, and redemption. And so she jumps in here. And uh, I had to leave out a couple of these pages, but she's swimming around underwater with these fish who all have topics written on their sides. And what was that? Oh, and, and a fish bites her. Oh, and now she has her topic. And, and interestingly enough, the fish bites her and the fish dies. And this is, this is a significant thing for Campbell in that the rebirth is dependent on the death of something else. So the student has to die in order to be reborn now with the topic, okay? Okay, now, and this is where the library gets big right here. Uh, um, the library is, we've seen Scarlet 
Sanchez's comment. She's dwarfed by the library. <laughs> but the library is cool. But is it really cool? We see her head in her hands. And it's like this, she's sort of ambivalent. Yeah, I guess it's cool. Um, well, it seems I will be spending most of my time in the library this year. So this whole thing here uh, of the library, this is only the very beginning uh, of the library. And let's see. Yeah, so, so, so let's move on here. OK. Oh, the library represents, for Campbell, he talks about when the student leaves the everyday world and goes into this new world. He refers to this as the worldwide womb. Okay? <laughs> the, the, for, the, for the student, the counterpart is the worldwide web. Okay, this is where most of the research gets done, okay? A and libraries are places of mystery and fear for students. They don't necessarily understand databases, and once they find, get to the databases and their topics, they 5,000 articles <laughs> on, on, on this. What do I do now? And you, so you see here, um, I know the assignment isn't due <laughs> until April, but I'm going to get started next up research. Yuck. Where do I even start? Ask a librarian. Okay? And, and so, uh, uh, again, this is, we see, now I'm going to deal more with this later, but one of the big things with the library is the library is a supernatural aid. <laughs> for the student. Even though the student, even though the student fears it, this is where they go for help. If you need to find help with your topic, if you need to sort out these databases, if you need to get instructed on informational literacy, you go to the library. Okay? Um, so, and again, this is part of the whole thing. We are now in the belly of the whale, and the student confronts academic discourse. And so I didn't really expect the articles to be this confusing. It's like reading Chinese. Uh, and, and it's like, oh, my God, a foreign language. And, and the fact is, she is not alone. I read academic articles where I throw up my hands. And it's like, who can understand this? It's like. You know, maybe I should send my PhD back to Arizona State because clearly I wasn't bright enough to understand what's being published. Okay, not, and, and once they have the articles, then they have to do something with them. They have to know how to cite them. Um, and, they, and they confront APA. Now, for Burke, I need to go back and tell you a little bit about Burke. For Burke, the whole thing of guilt, there's guilt, purification, and redemption. It, and in order for uh, the hero to be redeemed, it requires the use of body analogies, which are often related to what Burke calls the fecal motive. But it, basically, every time students use shit and crap, it's like they're sort of <laughs> suggesting that. Wow, those citations are kicking my ass. OK, this is body analogy. I'm still not even done. She looks in the mirror. Mirrors are huge things in, 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 in graphic novels and comics. And the whole thing, the idea of somebody looking at a different version of themselves. And Claire Dobbins uh, looks in the mirror and, and look, points at herself accusingly. Listen, Claire, this lit review is shitting on you right now, and it should be the other way around. Again, <laughs> this, is, this is mortifying to her. And, and the mortification is sort of redeemed by, she's acknowledging that the lit review is shitting on her. So the whole thing of shame is addressed by acknowledging one's shame. And again, s same thing. Uh, now here we have uh, um, Willow Whitliff, and we have um, references to supernatural aids. Uh, this one traditional, oh dear lord, APA. Crap, I forgot to include page numbers. So Shit, how do you cite a source within a source? Which is, which is like really 
a labyrinthian task for like students. Um, and, and again, we have the fecal motive. <laughs> now, he, so here, this, here's another one. Uh, uh, so the road of trials is a series of papers. They do the annotated bibliography. They do the arguments paper. Eventually, they get to the literature review. This arguments paper is driving me insane. I must be doing something seriously wrong. This assignment cannot possibly be this hard. A and my guess is that this is probably sort of close to what some <laughs> people experience when they're doing the lit review. I, I have all these sources. How do I organize them? What's the, how do I structure this? OK. Um, so, <laughs> now, so now I'm going to look at the lit review at, at the lit review as the shadow, as a point of shade. Now, you see here, the lit review is talking to her. You're never able to conquer me. Mwahaha, which is the typical evil <laughs> laughter of the villain <laughs> in, in, in comics. But, but um, <laughs> Renee uh, Sandelson is not taking any shit from the lit review. <laughs> Shut up, lit review. I'm, per I'm perfectly capable of this assignment. Uh, but what about APA? You don't even know it. You've done MLA your whole life. <laughs> <laughs> you may be wrong. I may suck at APA, but I have all the tools on my side. And again, here she goes to the web and gets, gets some help. Here's another view uh, of shame, the monster uh, lit review. It invades their sleep. OK, so the whole thing uh, of, of boundary breaking and shape shifting the lit review becomes uh, a monster. Uh, and, and there's a guy named Cohen who's written this book called Monster Theory. And he talks about how the lit review, or, or the monster always escapes. And that's what happens. You wake up from the dream, and the monster is still there. The lit review still has to be done. Um, here's a more traditional view. I need guidance and prayer. Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> and, and, and here we have you know, uh, the cross uh, in, you know, on the library. <laughs> and, and again, suggesting that the library is, in fact, a supernatural aid. And it's inscribed <laughs> with this cross. OK. Who are you? I'm the motivation fairy. I'm here. That's what I'm here for. I seem to be lacking this. I'm just the thing. I call it my special motivation mojo. Wow, thanks, motivation theory, uh, fairy. And, and see here, we have sort of, sort of, some sort of Cinderella thing with the tiara. Um, but we also have, less obviously, the whole thing of mojo, which on one hand could be more Joe, as in coffee, but it's also the idea of mojo relating to sex. A a and that's also part of mojo, as in, uh, Muddy Waters, uh, by way of Ann Cole, got my mojo working, but it sure won't work on you. Okay, so <laughs> and even so, and, and this we see sort of like the limitations of the supernatural age. I'm I'm Sir Charles Van Ra, and I'm here to tell you to get your shit together. Like, and, and you know, she feels shame and. and these various signs are pointing to her, are saying, you can always transfer, kid. You know, <laughs> annual giving. Come to us. We will give you advice here. Right? Uh, and pull me, which always seems to me, uh, every time I see this part, the pull me, I think of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Where, and those illustrations, drink me. Yeah. Right? Um, where do I turn? OK, so. So, so, so at some point, in Campbell's journey, the student um, has to deal with an ultimate challenge, uh, the supreme challenge, the supreme ordeal. And for students, this is procrastination. <laughs> okay. And now, again, let's think about this in terms of ideology. Procrastination is the faculty's word. He says. OK, class, seriously, don't procrastinate on the lit review. I can guarantee you will regret it. It's like, but for the student, it might be, hey, man, I'm just taking a break. I've been working my tail off. I need to relax a little. So here she bows to peer pressure, even though she knows I should really stay in at work. 
no, please come out and go dancing with us. And, okay, you guys win. So now, in, in Lauren DeLisle's comic, her supernatural aid was SpongeBob SquarePants, <laughs> who is sort of a trickster um, type supernatural aid, and he often leads her uh, down the wrong path. And here he's helping her. You know, she's, productivity is for suckers. Turn up the Bob Marley man. <laughs> okay, and, and we can see like, you know, days left to complete the draft. Thirty. Okay. <laughs> now, now, so my sense, I always thought that procrastination was going to be related to sloth, lazy students who won't start their work. And, and, and the fact is, I started looking at books on uh, the seven deadly sins, and one of them actually said, sloth is related to procrastination. And I was totally okay with that until I started seeing some other stuff. So if we're thinking about, if we're, if we're thinking about sin, we've got sloth on one hand, we have pride on another. So here we have the student's parents' pride being leveraged against the student. So she's, this is her mom talking. Hi, honey, how are you? You're dead, and I just want to say how proud we are if you always staying on top of your work, being such a good student. And you can see how well this goes over with the student. Ugh, okay, fine, back to work I go. Um, so, so this whole thing of, of procrastination being uh, related to perfectionism whether it's the students on perfectionism or, or the perfectionism being heaped on them by the professor or their parents, okay? And there's been a, a number of studies that, that have linked um, procrastination um, with perfectionism. Now, here's an interesting one because this actually combines both of them. The cat is a symbol of sloth. It wants the fish, but it won't get its feet wet. I actually read this in, in a book. And, and they, they were talking about images, animal images of sloth. And so here we have, you know, what if this degree is a total waste of time, only distracting me from my goals? Cat? Yeah. You're right, Harriet. So what does she do? She cleans it. Perfect time to arrange my, rearrange my book collection, clear out her drunk junk drawer, organizer color, get rid of these old clothes, dust. Okay, when, when uh, Susie and I were in, in graduate school, uh, uh, one of our um, professors, Fred Corey, uh, said, you know, for graduate students, um, graduate students have the cleanest toilets of anybody <laughs> because they'd rather do anything than write. <laughs> okay, and we sort of see that here. And this certainly goes into Burke's idea of being rotten with um, perfection. So we come to this place where it's make or break time. The student has to like pony things up. And we see here this image of the spiral, which is, is sort of like hypnotizing the student. The student becomes zombie-like. I can't do this. Overwhelming stress. But she snaps out of it. Oh my God, the lit review is defeated. Okay, so, it, so she actually does do what she needs to do. And we see another one, same thing. Wow, you're getting up early, you're getting a lot done. Gah. Again, the spirals. But this time the spirals are, are augmented with drool. <laughs> okay, and, and, and again, th this is drool is like, like sex and, and shit and piss and vomit and, and pus. It's like the body analogy. And, and drool would go in there. Okay, so this body analogy being redeemed, she, she's in the zone. I mean, this isn't, she, she's hypnotized, but she's hypnotized by this hard work that she's doing. Okay, Harriet, we should leave Maria alone. She looks like she is in the zone. And, and, and she must have been because now she's in a PhD program. So she figured out how to, how, how to like use her drool constructively. Okay. All right. So, so we have this other thing. So after this supreme or ordeal, um, we have what um, 
what Campbell calls atonement, which is sort of like re uh, re reconciliation, reparation for offense. And we have Madeline Jones, who used the theme uh, from Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas story. So she had these the ghosts, uh, uh, lit reviews, past, present, and future, were her supernatural aids. But at some point, the hero has to leave the supernatural aids behind when they come to the, the end of, when they're the threshold of the return. The supernatural aids have to stay behind. And so the, the ghost tells her, go, write, win. <laughs> and I was looking up the word go in dictionary, and one of the definitions is go is to leave behind. Okay? Um, to tell you the truth, it's like dictionaries are wonderful things. Uh, okay, so, so, okay, so here, here's another thing of, uh, of reconciliation or atonement. We have Shauna Duong, and I was only able to use a couple of her checklists, and I wanted to use the checklist because checklists are sort of like logical form of discourse as opposed to narrative, um, even though they appear, the logic appears within a narrative. So here we see her first checklist, um, and, and what this represents is her ego being totally out of control. Okay, pick a topic. These are not problematic. Write the lit review. Victory dance, eternal glory and honor. Get an A in the class. Laugh at others. Her ego is like seriously out of control. And we see like the sparkle in her eye, the raised fist, and the smile being duplicated on her t-shirt. Okay? Now, this doesn't work for her. So you're not going to see a couple of the slides where... She's sitting in a blanket surrounded by empty ice cream cartons and flies <laughs> buzzing over her body. Um, but she revises her thinking. Here's the more realistic checklist. Have a mental breakdown. Cry some more. Feel pathetic. Sleep the sadness way. Turn in lit review. Hope for the best. Now, now for Campbell, this is sort of thing like having trust in God and... and, and <laughs> faith that the father or mother or whatever will, will do the right thing by you. Now, interesting thing, we see the downturned face. So this little spot right here is an eye and this is her mouth and she doesn't look happy. We've got the sweat. Now, you also see these bars on her hair, which sort of suggests to me some sort of mental prison. I don't think she did that you know, consciously, but, <laughs> but nonetheless it's there. I'll interpret what, you know, what I can see. And again, we have the stripes here, which sort of look like a prisoner's outfit, a convict. Okay, so we have these, these, these vertical and horizontal bars that both sort of lead us toward this idea uh, of imprisonment. Um, but it's a more realistic thing. But ultimately she ends up doing it. Okay, the l last part is apotheosis, which actually deals with the deification uh, <laughs> of the hero. Now, in, 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 and this, all of these examples I'm using, there are like numerous examples. I wish I could have done all of them, but you can read the book and see more. <laughs> and, um, so Claire uh, Dobbins uses the Superman pose. I've heard that making the Superman pose before doing something important helps. And, in, in the world of comics, superheroes are sort of like godly type avatars on Earth. They're the closest we get. Superman, godlike guy, okay? Wonder Woman, like a god. Now, this is the most fascinating one to me, where this, this woman used, um, and, and she was a real trickster, because she basically ignored my instructions. <laughs> Which is what she's supposed to do if you're a trickster. They're, they, they resist structure. They break the rules. So she used the, uh, a comic to tell her story. So in here, the bad group, of the super villains, are called the villains of the lit. And you can see, we shall take over the earth and force them to write lit reviews forever. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, and, and again, see, we have the evil laughter here. Um, the interesting thing. I was included in part of this. I was sort of the leader of the opposing force, the, the good superheroes. But she cast me as Moon Knight, um, who is a superhero that suffers from schizophrenia, uh, <laughs> associative disorders. Uh, uh, somebody would carve crescents into their forehead of their victims. Now, the interesting thing was the woman who did this comic, her name was Nuf al Marzouk, and she was from Saudi Arabia. Well, she cast me as Moon Knight, who comes from, it was related to an Egyptian god <laughs> named Khonshu. Who, and so the idea is we have identification there between the student who is from Saudi Arabia and my superhero persona, Moon Knight, who is also uh, um, Arabic. And So the only way that they're not going to take over the, wor the world is if she writes a lit review. <laughs> so she steps up and, and she does write the lit review. A and as a result, so she, she would be, within comic book hero talk, she would be considered an ally of the superheroes. But she goes beyond being an ally. She writes the lit review and she becomes godlike. Ah, Zook, you are not an official member. Welcome to the League of Shibles, <laughs> which, which, which is what she called the, the opposing group of superheroes. And it's like, really, you shouldn't have. <laughs> okay. Now, so, so now we get to um, the end, or, or close to the end, at least, and. The student is, has returned from the, stu the, the uh, um, kingdom of dread, and you can see she's finished her lit review, and now she's starting her comic, although actually she's finished the comic because that's <laughs> what we're looking at. And it ends with, that's all, folks. Now, this image to me is very interesting because it looks like it's concentric circles, but I don't see it at target. I see it as a space going into something else. And, and if you look at, this is from Looney Tunes. <coughs> and some of the images they have here, they have a bunch of comic book heroes like Yosemite Sam uh, standing outside that circle. So there's something beyond them. So it's like, that's all, folks. No, it's not all at all, y'all. Okay, there's actually something going on here. And anyhow, that's how I'm thinking about it. Uh, <coughs> on one hand, this is the gratification of the reader's um, desires. Um, now, so we end up with the return. And, and Campbell talks about the return in several ways. He talks about uh, the, the student brings back the boon to help her tribe or world or society. And, and you know, what constitutes the boon? And it's like, it's clearly not the lit review. I mean, walk by any faculty office and you'll see a stack of unclaimed academic papers that the students don't even bother to pick up. So it's like, the lit review is not the boon. Uh, well, and, and nor for that matter is the comic, at least not in the way Campbell's talking about it. Now, we can say that the individual comic, well, the student becomes uh, more well-versed at telling, telling a story using words and images, which may, in fact, be a useful thing out in the world, particularly if they're going into marketing or advertising. Um, no. So it's not, it's not the individual comic. What it is is so what happens now? And, and I'm, I'm going to turn this over sh very shortly to uh, um, um, Melanie. But the idea here is that 
The library is going to publish this book. It will be sent out, certainly by me, to every fa uh, faculty member I can find. I, I know in the past, the library has sent comic assignments out to the community of online research. Um, I'm, where's Susan? Susan, am I, am I saying that, that right? Almost got it. Community of online research assignments. Research assignments, OK. Um, So the whole idea of using comics, sending it out across the country, that, and the idea that other faculty might go, hey, this is not that hard. My students can do this. Now, let me go back and say something. The first day of class, uh, I, um, I, I walk in. I tell them all about the lit review. Uh, and then I say, OK, take out your cameras. And they start shooting photos. And I flip the bird just to let them know that I'm game and they shouldn't worry about censoring themselves and I don't care if they use like curse words in their comic. Just to let it, just to free them up, okay? Uh, which you can see that they sort of, <laughs> sort of did. Uh, um, and, and then I tell them the, the, the first comic is due at the end of the week. And they, it's only like a two or three page comic. And for the last several years, Susan and I, I would get these comics and I would give them to Susan and Susan would uh, select ones that she, she thought were particularly interesting and those would be displayed. And now we're sending, now we're displaying it out into the world. The, yeah, into the World Wide Web. Anyhow, so that, that's basically um, my presentation. That, do, I, do I do okay, time-wise? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so um, uh, Melanie, would you like to... Uh, sure. So before I launch it, I just want to say, Dean, I think Susan and Dean showed up at my door, I don't know, when was it? it was sometime last spring, maybe? And um, they're like, hey, could you do, well, not, Susan was asking me this, Susan was um, guiding, she was um, Dean's guide. Uh, and uh, she was like, hey, could you do this thing, I want to make an ebook. And I was like, sure, that's no problem. And then he told me what it was about, and I was like, oh my god, I have no idea how we're going to do this. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it was actually one of those things, that it, was a, it was a work in progress. Actually, I didn't know what we were getting into. I don't think Dean exactly knew what we were getting into. Uh, but one day he came to me, and he started talking about myth and all these sorts of things. I'm like, great. And, uh, and just pieces kept coming in, and then we, you know, it was one of those things where, like, what do we have to work with here? How are we going to approach this? Um, and uh, one thing, you know, the whole idea of doing this is, in part, to kind of create a public scholarship, right? This is not just for academics, this is for the public. Uh, and Dean's first um, pass of the book was longer, and not too long, it was actually like a reasonable length. I think it was like, what, 40 pages or something like that? It was like, so in that, in that sense, that's, that's friendlier to the public, I think. Uh, but there's a lot of theory and stuff in it. And so we started talking about that, and we're like, maybe there's more than w one way to write this, you know? There could be a more sort of theoretical, complex way of doing this, and that's for one audience. Uh, and then there can be a more simple way to do this for another audience, even students, you know. Um, and, you know, this is the digital world, so you can really do that. So we had these conversations like this, um, and I knew we were going to be needing to, of course, incorporate, incorporate a lot of media. Sorry, I can't see the mouse. I can kind of see it, almost. Oh, wait, I don't even need it. Hang on. Sorry, this is, like, really hard. Okay, so uh, I'll launch it. This is really hard. Okay, so this is the landing uh -huh. page. I love that. And um, I think I can. Uh, there we go. So um, I, you know, I wanted it to be in terms of the aesthetic. Um, I wanted, of course, to have a comic thing, but I didn't want to go too crazy. Uh, so this is the main comicy part of it. Um, but we decided, okay, so there's going to be these two paths. So we just literally called them the simple and the complex path. Um, and you know all these sorts of things that we wanted to do with it. That's how we decided 
what digital tool to put this in. It shouldn't be, we want to use this tool and therefore we'll make these things fit. It's like, we, there is this content, what will, it, what will do, um, what will be the best container for that content? And so the, the container we chose was Scalar, which is a publishing platform, it's open source. And it allows you to create paths, so it's sort of a book-like experience. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, it also allows for things like annotation, which was one of the big selling points because Dean wanted um, Susan to contribute, to put sort of her um, take on things. And so the best way to do that, really the most effective way, was not to have her write another chapter or something like that. It was actually to have her voice enter the conversation. Um, and Scalar does a very good job of that. The other thing about Scalar is you can, it's a really hard tool to explain in some ways, uh, it, it, they, they say it's as easy as um, working in a blog. It's not true. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why they say that. Um, I don't know what blog they're talking about. Um, but it's not super technically challenging. It's conceptually challenging. So just to think, just to think about how you're going to, like the, the information architecture, that's, for me, was the more challenging part of this, not the technical part of this. Um, and um, lost my train of thought there. But, um, so Susan was able to put these annotations. We, um, oh, I, I know what I was gonna say. What I was gonna say was that you can, what's so interesting about Scalar is, okay, bear with me. Everything's on the same plane. So you, you upload images, you create pages, um, you create annotations and all these things, and you can mix and match them in ways that you cannot do that in a normal website. So you can have a, a web page that has annotations on it, and you can actually take the media and have those be annotations. Oh. You can annotate media with a page. So it's, it's like kind of hard to explain that, it's hard to visualize that, but basically everything's on equal footing. Nothing's marginalized, so it's not like this is just a footnote and it can only be a footnote. It can very easily be morphed into a page or something like that. So it's sort of like sand going through your fingers a little bit. You're like, okay, where, where are the, what are the limitations here? Where do we stop? Um, and so that was really kind of fun to figure some of that out. So this interface here, um, <clears throat> everything on here is clickable with the exception of the top banner. So for example, we can go into the introduction. Dean basically, he gave me a just traditional book and then we looked at, okay, how, like this is not a traditional book anymore. So how do we organize these things? Where do, what, at what point do we step into the book? How do we break it up? Um, so for example, I'll show you. Okay, okay so this is, um, this is just a standard uh, scalar page. The only thing I really added was this background. I did do some um, work in terms of the format, the way that the layout and everything's a little bit changed. Um, it's pretty much an out of the box tool, but for me to have this layout the way I wanted it to and to have some of the effects and stuff, I did go in and make some <clears throat> changes into things like the HTML and the code. Um, so let me get to the pages here. <laughs> so, you, so you, yeah, so you go through, and the thing is, this is, so you have really good metadata, this is for librarians, no one else cares about this probably, but you can hover on this and you can actually get more information, which is really handy. Um, and, um, and I can change what appears in terms of the information. So if I want to make that, if I want to have more information below the image, I can. Um, the images are actually, they are easily made larger. And so there's times in here that, um, so you see the yellow, that's Dean and me conversing about changes and things like that. So that's to show you, hey, you can highlight this, that's nice. But also we're still working on it. Um, and so I can, uh, we can talk to each other that way. Um, but, so you can see how small this image is. Sometimes that's necessary based on the content of the page, just like the layout and everything. So of course people can always look at it larger. So Susan went in, I think I see a one right here. You have to get permission from all the students. You got permission, Dean. Yeah. 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 But that's a really good point. Yeah, that, this would not be something we could just do. Um, so here's an example of an annotation. So Susan went in and did this, so she's selecting certain words. The words she selected are important too because that's what you associate with her annotation. So she's making that connection there. And so her voice is entering this, um, giving you more insight and from a librarian's perspective. <clears throat> and there's times when I actually do annotate with images. So I don't think in this particular path, in the complex path, Dean references images from before. Instead of bringing those directly into the page, which could throw you off, I just put them as annotations. There's these ways you can do this kind of work where you just have, to, it's very strategic. When you think about it, it's, a, it's like writing. I mean, it's a form of, um, it's its own rhetoric. Okay, so.
So I'll just go back to that thing here. So one more thing we're going to add. Um, I'm in the process of doing it, which is we're going to have a gallery of some of the, the featured students. Oh, so this is, of course, the most adorable one, so I put it up. Uh, but we're going to have more of them, probably have about eight of them or something. Um, so Scalar has these sorts of widgets and pages and things in it that you can do this sort of work with. So it's, it's for us, it's you know, sort of just figuring out you know, what they already have and how we can use it most effectively. And then if it's not working for us, what do we need to do to make it more functional? So like, like I said earlier, going into the code and things like that. So I think, I think that's all I had for talking about this. I hope it made sense because I think when you talk about digital, it can be really hard uh, to relate to. Can you just show us the difference between the simple path? Sure, and the absolutely, path? yeah, okay. So it looks very similar. One thing you probably won't notice, but all the all the uh, complex path has a blue header. Oh. Just little tricks like that. That's the thing about um, design is that very easily you can get confused in a website, but even more easily you, you can get even more easily confused in Scalar, which is something that I keep looking at. It's just the nature of the tool. So I'm trying to figure out ways to clue people in. Um, so you can see these pages are longer. What's interesting when you think about a a standard book, your, pa your, your content is divided up based on how much fits on a page, but there's no page limitation here. So then we're like, okay, that's not how we divide this content up, right? Um, so it's just approaching it differently. So this is a lot like a long page, right? And we could maybe break that up. It may, it may make sense eventually to do that. Um, but then we have some much shorter pages, and some pages with tons of images and some with few. Um, so Susan went through and um, put annotations on the simple path, which I think just audience-wise that makes the most sense. Um, so this one is more just straightforward uh, theory. Dean, is this is Dean. Dean no. going theory crazy. Yes. Melanie, yeah. that, that thing that looks like a comment box bubble at the bottom, yeah. is that what that is? Like what is that? That thing? is, you know, I was looking at the day, it's funny Susan brought this up with me too. Um, that would require you oh, to to sign in, okay. yeah, yeah, but there, but there are ways to add on to it. add users, okay. yeah, yeah. So we'd have to add users. Yes. If if a if a professor at another school wanted to add his or her comments to this, mm -hmm. that could be easily done. Yeah, exactly. That's so. I mean, Susan was asking me that today, so and um, <laughs> yeah. So basically, it's sort of like WordPress, where you have to you create new user accounts. So we could create user accounts. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and if anybody else has a question, we're naturally transitioning into the Q&A yeah, segment so of the, of the event. So I, I'm happy to pass around the microphone. Okay. Okay, Chris. So um, I'm not going to start with a question. I'm going to start with a comment. And high praise for all of you because this is such creative, engaged teaching and learning, and such an amazing collaboration between faculty and librarians and students. You're all creating together, and it's, you know, it's why we made you our featured a contributor to Cora, uh, because this is just such an amazing kind of assignment, and it's the sort of thing that we want librarians and other faculty to adopt as, as creative ways to teach students. So kudos to all of you, Melanie, Dean, Susan, and all of your students, because it's just really an amazing project, and I'm really proud of all of you. I, I'm, I'm in the book. I'm so proud of all of you. I'm like your mother. So. Thank, thank, thank you. Because I haven't spoken enough yet. Um, I actually want to know why you chose to read this through the myth lens. What's a meth lens? Oh, yeah. 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 You know what meth is. You can answer that. Forget, forget that drug reference. It is related to the trickster, however. Uh, uh, why myth? It just sort of seemed to me as I was reading these that there seemed to be some sort of mythic quality to it that there. You know, I was looking at the monsters, uh, um, and 
I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I know that it's like, I knew that Kenneth Burke had, um, had written about myth, but it, it's, so, it, it, it's sort of interesting. One, one of the things, it wasn't where I naturally gravitated to, and, and for the following reason. There was a, a wonderful um, scholar in our field, sadly, who passed away, named uh, Janice Hawker Rushing, who did a bunch of articles on sort of mythic analysis of film. Um, where she looked at, at um, you know, Batman and Terminator and um, what was that one with Harrison Ford? The, um, Indiana Jones. No, well, yeah, that, but there, there was another one where, uh, I forget what it was called. Um, tell you, I look it up on my Ro um, Blade Runner? Blade Runner, <laughs> that was it. Okay, but one of the things was is that I knew or, or I had heard that that a lot of producers and directors were familiar with Campbell's theory of myth, a, a, and that in fact it had been used as a blueprint to to you know create these films. And I was going, well, geez, no wonder they found myth, myth in the film. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were using it to create the film. So, which you sort of sounded to me, I, I wasn't sure what to make a, out of it. It was like sh sort of like shooting fish in a barrel. Al although when she was doing that, she would often get much deeper uh, in, in things like um, Trickster and Shadow. Uh, Janice Hawker ru rush Rushing definitely um, got me going in terms of this. And then when I discovered uh, um, Jung, I was looking at um, his chapter on the, on the Trickster, which was... He didn't spend a huge amount of time on the trickster. It was much more related to the shadow. But there was a footnote um, where he referenced an article um, by uh, uh, somebody named Alan McGlashan, who wrote uh, in a 1953 issue of The Lancet, a medical journal, saying that, wow, you know, if you look at comics, you can see Jung's ideas. And I'm going, well, there it is. It's like somebody applying you to comics. A and that was, that sort of made me feel really good because it's like, okay, I, I, I'm not completely on Dean, the wrong path. You used a lit review to create the assignment on the lit review. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> you used the literature. Lit review. Yeah, I did. That was actually part of my question too. I'm trying to imagine myself in your class, and it's like, so did you actually have a student come to actually create an original lit review, followed by actually doing this assignment? And what were some of the biggest challenges? Yeah, the the, the, the the students spend the the almost the entire um, semester working on the lit review. There are several uh, preliminary assignments, and then they do. The, the lit review, a and it's like they, I introduce them to APA, and we have uh, assignments on paraphrasing and citing. Um, so I only give them that comic the first week of the semester to make sure that they get on Comic Life 3, or Comic Life, and, and that they have a clue about how to create the comics. It's like, look, you created a comic in a week. And this is what you're going to have to do at the very end of the semester. So they usually, now for some people like Shauna Duong or, or uh, Lauren uh, DeLisle, where they were hand-drawn comics, they, they didn't start like the last couple of weeks. And, and, and let me say something. I, I, I picked, um, you know, comics where people had spent some quality time on the creation of the comic. It can easily show you somebody's comic where it's like, Wow, great 50 selfies you took, pal. It, you know, where it's like just one, the same selfie over and over again with like bad lighting. And, and you know, obviously some of these um, people had to recruit other people, other students or roommates to help them create the comic. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, Rick. Rick okay, yeah, so it's... Um, so it was more or less along the lines of giving them an opportunity, let them vent, let them have fun. People who, who write about academic writing say, you know, we need to make more opportunities for
for creative writing. So I was hoping that that would do it, and figured it might actually help my teaching evaluations to e end with a, with a, with a comment. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Professor McDaniel. Susie McDaniel, the wife. We worked this out on every dog walk every day for the last couple of years. But um, you might share that, that you, or I will at least, that your initial foray into this medium was with students using it uh, in relationship to our mission statement. Right, LMU mission in the uh, that, the 400 level Well, the, um, yeah, I, I did. I'm, I'm not exactly sure on the order, but I did have a qualitative method, capstone class where they had to do a regular project and then they had to do uh, a comic. So I've actually had um, a few students, and I actually did a few independent uh, studies with students. One with a, a young woman who is uh, transgender, and she did her, uh, like a you know 35-page comic uh, on the process of, uh, of transgendering. Uh, another woman did one on her issues with um, anger management. And that's what I'm doing this semester. Uh, uh, I have some really amazing students, such as <laughs> Lexi Hofer, who is doing a comic uh, for me. Uh, there's uh, another young woman in Lexi's class. She's doing a comic about um, dealing with her mother who suffers from schizophrenia. Another young woman who is in that sandwich generation and she's talking about dealing with her mom who has Alzheimer's disease at the same time she's dealing with her, her daughter. A and Lexi is also doing a, a very personal, intense um, comic that I know is going to be wonderful. No pressure. I need to help that pal. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, John from the library. Um, at one point you mentioned that the, the moment of procrastination or the character of procrastination is a reoccurring theme or moment in, in the student comics and that your perception of procrastination has changed over time. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, what you meant by that. Okay, sure. It, it, obviously, if somebody is constantly procrastinating and, and doing like lousy work, well, chance. Are they really going to be in college? You know, so the whole idea of you can be slothful, but <laughs> if you're really slothful, you may not be passing the classes. It's like, yeah, congratulations. You did this the night before. Certainly looks like it. <laughs> F. Uh, <laughs> try again next semester, pal. Um, but but uh, you know, other times, um, they're not ready to do their best work, or, or they still have questions or confusion, uh, and they m may need more um, discussion with me or with the library uh, um, to get them past that place um, of, of procrastinating. Um, and, and again, I think the whole thing is I think procrastination, maybe that. They have adopted our word, so they refer to it as procrastination, even when it's not. Even if somebody is taking a well-deserved break because she's been working her tail off on the project, she often still um, refers to it as procrastinating. I shouldn't pro procrastinate. Um, but that just sort of goes to the extent in which the dominant ideology uh, of academic discourse has sway you know, o over the language um, that we use. Um, Brian. Well, um, Dean, allow me to begin in the same way that Chris does. I, I just think that this is phenomenal work, both your individual scholarship, but also the, the collaboration between you, your students, and our colleagues in the library. Um, and Thank you. I've had over the last several years the pleasure of seeing uh, varying stages of this particular process. <laughs> You know, sometimes completely horrified by some of the images, <laughs> right? you know, and sometimes me shaking my finger saying, is this necessary, right? You know, but seeing the evolution of this project in some beautiful and wonderful and just smart ways, 
you know, including the exhibition in the Student Art Gallery, you know, in which so many diverse aspects of how your students enter this project, you know, were, were showcased as, as artistic expression, you know, in, a, in alignment with the critical intellectual academic, you know, endeavor of, of, of the work. So just congratulations. Um, I'm also wondering about this notion of procrastination and when, for, and, and maybe this is not a question as much as a comment, as the point when, when procrastination or the accusation of procrastination becomes a shaming device, one that we direct to others, you know, but when we claim it on ourselves, we claim the shame as a, as a mechanism of motivation, right? And so I call it procrastination, so I shame myself, and maybe that's a replay of my parents' voice or my teacher's voice, you know, and it, I shame myself into motivating myself, you know, to get the work done, right? right. Um, but I'm actually very curious about that bubble again, you know, on the screen and the ability for the reader, any um, observer, any teacher to comment on that. You know, what, what future do you see, um, or if, if not the bubble, then the comment box that you were referencing earlier, what, what future generation of, 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 of uh, interdisciplinarity, of, of collaboration do you see by drawing upon the comments that people have entered into the project? Is it, a, is it possible for you to then sort of harvest those comments and use it in a different way? Wow. Uh, I could see that happening, um, although if I have my drug, I, I think it's going to take until I retire to get I'll probably keep on working on this so I can have a more sophisticated sense uh, of myth. Um, and I have a few other projects I think I might want to do related to myth. But what I really want to do, it, last year, um, National Communication Association, a, a group of, of, of scholars who are interested in comics were trying to get a comics and graphic novel division going. And they missed it by a a few people. And uh, I, I presented a shorter version of this at NCA <coughs> um, this last year. And what, I'm really, what I really want to do is to send it out to people with the idea that it's like, you can use this form. You don't, it's like, nobody is, a, every student in my class knows more about technology than <laughs> I do. Uh, and they're tremendously uh, um, clever. So I've seen Lexi's comic, and, and it, it, it's gorgeous and colorful, and she puts on artistic effects on it. And I, th I think that, that there's a lot of untapped potential for this in terms of academia. I mean, not too long ago, um, well, a while ago, um, Walter Fisher, you know, the, na the, the, the narrative paradigm, we are, you know, homo narrans, people who tell stories, and it's like, okay, well, the stories are told with words and images. Mm. And one of the things that I forgot to, I, I didn't have time for do it, when I started off the whole thing, the whole book starts off with the whole, uh, a discussion of, of sin and, and the idea of we're overlooking um, the sunken gardens. And the words, the very words, library and book, if you look them up, they both have roots <laughs> in trees. Mm. And trees are related to knowledge. Uh, and knowledge at one time was thought to be, OK, I'm God, you're not, don't eat of that tree. Uh, and this was the big sin, and they got booted out of the garden. Well, if you look at Animal House, um, <laughs> the idea is that our idea of knowledge has changed. The opening scene is on Faber College, and we see a statue of the founder, and it pans down to the plaque, and it says, knowledge is good. Okay? <laughs> and the whole idea of the literature review is using 
knowledge and, and synthesizing that. So we're actually going from original sin to original synthesis. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, um, I'm not sure where I was going with that. <laughs> you on a roll. <laughs> I should have gone somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dean Scheibel. And that concludes the Q&A section of the event. However, we do have approximately 10 more minutes to mingle. The bar is still open until 7 o'clock. If you have your feedback forms, if you could please place those inside this, this plastic box, we would really appreciate that as well. And thank you to Melanie, and thank you to the Library Outreach Department as well for your, all your help in putting on today's event. And thank you for some students who showed up. Thank you very much.